Welcome to the Funny Because It's True podcast. I'm your host, Kevin McGeehan. The show is recorded live every other Tuesday at 10 p.m. at the Second City Hollywood in Los Angeles, California. Storytellers are either predetermined or chosen randomly on the night of the show to tell a true story based on different themes, and this podcast is a mixed bag of some of my favorites. The theme of this episode is Caught, Three Stories of Dicey Predicaments. Keith Ray gets caught in a closet, Jessica Lee Williamson gets caught in a lie, and I get caught at a nude beach. But let's not dawdle. First up, Keith Ray. This is based off the idea of, have you ever seen something you weren't supposed to see, and to make matters worse, uh, you couldn't tell anyone that you saw it? Uh, Back in uh, 1996, I was doing outdoor drama in Ohio. It was a 1,200-seat outdoor theater cast and uh, crew, about 60-plus people. And when you work in those environments, everybody becomes really clicky and high schooly and catty, you know, like, did you see what Sarah and, like, Michelle were doing? I go, oh, my God. I'm like, who the fuck cares? Uh, but there was a guy in the cast that was the, uh, the embodiment of like asshole behavior. He was always really mean to everybody. And in the show, I played, of a, na- uh, played a Native American. So, uh, so my only wardrobe was a, a loincloth. And if you can see how white my skin is, uh, I'm not Native American. So, so every day I'd have to put uh, Texas dirt on this really heavy uh, iron oxide based uh, uh, makeup. So I had to learn how to ride a horse as if I had ridden a horse my entire life. I'd never seen a real horse. I'm, <laughs> I'm from the inner city in Detroit, so uh, you know, I was really like, all right, let's do this. Uh, but I'm really secure in uh, my abilities, in my looks, you know, I'm not like overly confident or whatever, but this guy <laughs> always went out of his way of like, what's up, dude, you look like a fucking idiot, you know, like, just, <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Uh, but one day, uh, uh, I was seeing this girl in the cast, and we were trying to keep it like hush hush, and and uh, and it was very difficult to do. Uh, one day, there was this house party, and this asshole guy had this vest on that his uncle had given him, <laughs> and he walked up to people before the show. We had a rehearsal before the show, so he was like, "Hey, man, what do you think of my vest?" And people were like, "It's cool," <laughs> you know. And and he knew he must have known that everybody was like, "Fuck you, dude. Fuck you and your shitty fucking vest. You're an asshole. <laughs> Fuck you." But he was just, like begging for compliments. So uh, we, there was a house party. We go to this house party. And I just loved being a fly on the wall to all the people that he was asking, like, what do you think of my vest? And people were like, go fuck yourself, you know. Uh, and so the girl that I was seeing, the, the restroom in, the, in this giant house had two entrances. So I was like, hey, uh, sneak around, go into the restroom, I'll go on the other side, and we'll make out, and then you can leave your side, I'll come out my side, and nobody will know that we were in there. <laughs> Yay! Really cool plan! <laughs> So I go on my side, she goes in hers. Um, she leaves out of hers after we make out, you know. Uh, and as I'm coming out of mine, I freak out for some reason, and that asshole is coming in my door. So I'm like, oh, wait, and my logistics were off. Like, if he sees me coming out where she was, he'll know. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't want that guy knowing about any of that, because he'll out you about it. So uh, I do the idiot thing, and I dive into the closet. And the closet has one of those accordion folding doors, right? So I'm like next to this toilet paper, I'm under this big shelf, and I'm holding the center of the accordion doll. Of like, eh, if, if you hold it tight, no matter how strong he is, he won't be able to open it. <laughs> so uh, we had all been drinking. We were all underage, like 19, 20, but, but we were all drinking. And uh, I'm sitting in this closet, and I'm looking through the center of it, and all I could see was the back of him and his shitty fucking vest. <laughs> And the, the, the toilet lid up. And he's just standing there, and it's like uncomfortable silence. And I'm just like, pee already, just pee. And, uh, and he's, he can't. So he's, all I hear is, get out of my body. <laughs> <laughs> right? And I'm like, <laughs> oh, uh. so that was number one. It was really hard to not fucking laugh about it. 
<laughs> and then the other thing, I'm like, and I can't tell anybody that this is going on. <laughs> what, what were you doing in the closet? You know, all that stuff. <laughs> but, then, uh, but then I saw the chink in this fucking asshole's armor. He, uh, he ended up urinating and it was fine. Then he goes over to the mirror and he looks in, in the mirror and he's looking at his vest and, and reality hits him. And he's, and he's like looking at it and the vest isn't as cool as he thought it was. Oh. Yeah, right? Don't have sympathy for this cocksucker. <laughs> so he, uh, he's looking, like he's doing that, you know, that alpha male bullshit, you know, like, mm, no, you're not. Mm. So he looks, looks at himself and, uh, and he says this, he goes, I like my best. Oh. Yeah, right? Oh. And I'm like, Uh, thank you. So he, uh, he leaves, and I'm like, D if this had been one of those guys that like, looked around people's bathrooms and shit, he would have seen that they were fully stocked in Keith Ray's. <laughs> so I was like, ah. So he leaves, the door opens, I like, the door just fucking laughing. And uh, I guess the moral of the story is this. If you are, uh, uh, there are two people in the world those that are insecure about themselves and they're total dicks about it. Uh, or there are people that are secure in their own skin but happen to be in the closet. <laughs> Next up, Jessica Lee Williamson. In the summer of 2002, I worked as a cook at Yellowstone National Park. And originally on my application, I had applied for the position of tour guide and I wrote in the additional comment section that I had taken acting classes and that I had lots of charisma. <laughs> <laughs> and then after my phone interview, they decided I'd be better suited far away from all the happy people on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> and they put me in this place to cook meals for the employees of a gift shop that sold souvenir magnets and stuff that was made in China, but it depicted Native American images of like bald eagles and wolves in the moon. And when I got there, I realized that the majority of these employees that I'd be cooking for were old enough to collect social security. I was relieved because one of my coworkers was 21 years old, her name was Paula, and she had aspirations of moving to Truckee and becoming a massage therapist. <laughs> And my relief really quickly turned to horror when I realized that Paula was the type of person who always found a way to mention the fact that she was molested as a child. <laughs> so one day we were greasing the pans in the kitchen and I said, just trying to make small talk, I was like, oh, I really wish our dorm had a pool. And then she said, I got molested in a pool. <laughs> and so the summer went. And our supervisor was this woman named Deb. She was a divorcee, uh, just about ready to hit 60. And she was really into things like guns and men who shoot guns and Toby Keith. <laughs> and one day when she was shoving this block of Velveeta cheese into the microwave, she told me that she took her job as a summer supervisor really seriously, and she expected me to do the same. I had been having trouble taking my job seriously because we served canned corn in monkey dishes, and our 2% milk came out of something that looked like a soda machine. And... I think it was when I suggested that we fill our salt and pepper shakers every other day instead of every day in order to save time that Deb started hating me. <laughs> <laughs> Paula, you know, was always dropping in the molestation thing. And so she kind of had this soft spot in Deb's heart. And Deb just decided she had it out for me. She would come and knock on my dorm room, which was right down the hall from the kitchen. She'd come at six in the morning and tell me I didn't do a good enough job cleaning the mustards or, you know, it was always something that I had to go back and do. And then one day the night cook got taken away in an ambulance because he was like in his 70s and he had d diverticulitis or something and he could no longer be the night cook. And so she needed 
me or Paula to be the night cook. And I knew if I showed any kind of excitement whatsoever, you know, or raised my hand too quick, Deb would be like, keep your enemies closer. <laughs> so I just did nothing. I just acted like I didn't care what she did with me, you know. And before I knew it, I was working the night shift by myself. And I, you know, sing that song, The Night Shift, to myself. I was really excited about it, but fun times never last. And Deb <laughs> kept a hawk's eye on me, and she gave me a really set menu to adhere to. Like, she told me everything I had to cook every night. And she moved into the bedroom that was directly across from the kitchen. And then she also set up a comment card box, which would eventually be my downfall because <laughs> old people love to complain about stuff. And it filled up right away with, it was usually like a rhetorical question, like, why does this girl cut the lettuce this big? Or hasn't this girl ever heard of cottage cheese? And then one night, it was hot dog night, I heard someone mutter the phrase, my colon will never forgive me. <laughs> and I just got really fed up. And I decided if everyone else could complain, then I could complain too. So I wrote on a comment card, we're so damn sick of hot dogs. And I stuffed it in the box. And really, I was more sick of cooking hot dogs than I was of eating them. But if I had written that on the card, it wouldn't have been anonymous. <laughs> And so a week later, Deb calls a meeting with corporate from the head office, and she hands out these enlarged photos of my comment card. <laughs> and we're all sitting in there, and they're like mulling over it for an hour, and I had this notebook, and I'd, I'd written on the cover of it in like a red Sharpie marker, M-Y-O-B, and I could just see Deb's eyes going from the notebook to the, we're so damn sick of hot dogs. <laughs> and then from the notebook to we're so damn sick of hot dogs. And I could just feel it and see that Columbo moment on her face when it's like, <laughs> everything's finally coming together. And then just in a really passive aggressive way, she suggested that we all write down a suggestion <laughs> to rectify the situation. And then she passed me a pen and I picked up the pen with my left hand because, <laughs> because I'm really smart and because I'm not going to go down like that. <laughs> and I wrote my suggestion with the confidence and the wherewithal of a five-year-old child. <laughs> and I wrote, maybe we could stop cooking hot dogs so often. <laughs> Thank you. And finally, me, Kevin McGeehan. My mother, Patty, up until the age of when I was 14, thought that I would, in her words, turn out gay. <laughs> and this was coming from a, an ill-informed uh, pre-baby boomer that didn't quite understand that homosexuality does not necessarily uh, come from nurture. She was concerned because she was a single mom and she thought because she infused my life with so much classical music, um, <laughs> British literature, and um, a, a huge appreciation for Barbara Streisand, who is very, very good if you grow up listening to just that. Um, she was scared that because of her influence that, that was, I was going to become gay. But she told me uh, later in life that there was one moment that made her know beyond a shadow of a doubt that that was not the case, and it was the day that I got the worst sunburn I've ever gotten. So when I was 14, we went, we flew across the country to California, to Santa Cruz, California, to go to one of my uncle's weddings. And they wanted to keep the family together, so they rented a house uh, for all of us to stay in. And it was the Clint Eastwood house that he stayed in during the filming of the movie, The Deadpool. How do I know this? They had Clint memorabilia in every room. <laughs> So we were staying in the Clint Eastwood house, and it was really nice, it was overlooked the ocean, and there was, one thing we were told when we first came in is that there is a private beach attached to the house, and there's one key that opens the lock. No more, just one. So, on one of the first days that we were there, all the family started reminiscing, and I was the youngest by far, I was the only kid 
there. Everybody else was the adults of the family, and no one had kids at that point, so it was just me, and I had nothing to relate to them with. They were sitting around reminiscing, talking, fighting, calling each other names, and I could not fit into the conversation because none of the things they were talking about I was even born for. And one of the things that always bothered me was the fact that I was never part of anyone reminiscing in my family. So, bored out of my mind, I take the one and only key to the beach, unlock the door, go down, and I walk across this long boardwalk, and then I walk down and it opens up to this rock-faced beach, just secluded from the house. You couldn't see it from the house, just this little alcove, just by itself. And I walked around, I walked into the ocean, and uh, it was really fun for about five minutes. And then I was bored. <laughs> and being a melanin-challenged adult, I can't stay out in the sun very often, or very long. So what I did is I kind of just sat in the shade for a minute, got bored, there was nothing for me to do, and then out of the corner of my eye, I see uh, two women approaching, and they make their way closer. They get about 25 feet from me, and because I was of that age, and I'd still do it now, uh, I wanted to see what they look like in bathing suits, so I kind of, <laughs> in my periphery, set up a nice stance so I could see, and then I was just gonna leave right after I got my glimpse, got my mental picture, and then could just move on. So as I'm, I see them put their stuff down and they start to uh, take off their moo-moos or whatever they were wearing and thinking they're going to go to their bathing suits and then as I turn to slowly and coolly make my way up and out, they take off all of their clothes and they're completely naked standing there and I plop right down on the sand <laughs> like that's what I meant to do. So now... These women are naked, 25 feet away from me. And at this point, at 14, I had never seen a boob in real life, let alone four. I don't know what to do because I want to stay and watch. But how can I do that and not seem creepy? Here's my plan. What I'm going to do is I'm going to keep changing positions like that's what I mean to do, even though I just want to get different angles of them naked. This goes on for two hours. Back at the Clint Eastwood house, my mother is flipping out. I said I was just going to go out for a little bit, and I took the one and only key and went down to the beach. So she's freaking out. So she takes her and my Uncle Andy, and they come running down, uh, trying to find me. They stand outside the gate, and they uh, convince someone who has a key to let them in. And then at the two-hour mark, as I'm sitting there, burned to a crisp, I look up, and I see my mother and uncle frantically running down this boardwalk, angry, seeing me, just so pissed, so the relief of worry gone, and then they see why I'm there. <laughs> and they immediately start laughing. We go back to the Clint Eastwood house, and my mother announces proudly when she was asked, where has Kevin been? He was looking at naked women. <laughs> so from that point, what changed that day? was that she knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that I was not gay. But the other thing that changed was the fact that now there was something that the family reminisced about later in life. Do you remember the time that Kevin went to the nude beach and got burned to a crisp? And then the next day when we all went down to the beach to see if we could see it, but all we saw was an old guy's dong? <laughs> we talked about that for years. That's it. That's our show. Special thanks to our storytellers, Keith Ray and Jessica Lee Williamson. Also thanks to Josh Callahan, Mark Orzeka, The Second City Hollywood, and the Comedy Podcast Network for producing the show. You can like Funny Cause It's True on Facebook to find out upcoming show dates and themes. All the past episodes are available for free download on the Comedy Podcast Network and iTunes. While on iTunes, feel free to leave a comment or a rating about the show. Now keep in mind, I understand the pain in the acidness of this request, but the more comments and ratings help the show grow to a broader audience on iTunes, and it also appeases my staunch desire for approval and acceptance. If you would ever like to see the live show, Funny Cause It's True is every other Tuesday at 10 p.m. at the Second City Hollywood, located on beautiful and yucky Hollywood Boulevard. So come out, put your name in contention, and maybe you'll get chosen to tell a true story on stage, and from there get chosen to be on the podcast. My name is Kevin McGeehan. Thanks for listening.
You have received this transmission from the Comedy Podcast Network. For more shows, visit comedypodcastnetwork.com.